Good morning, and welcome to the Museum of the San Ramon Valley's virtual speaker series. I'm Dan Dunn, the director of the museum. If you joined us last month, you'll remember that writer and historian Ann Schnobelin told us the story of Treasure Island in the 1939 to 1940 Golden Gate International Exposition known as the Pageant of the Pacific. You may remember an exhibit that we did at the museum in 2020, Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. The exhibit featured stunning photographs of California wildflowers in their natural environment. Today, we're fortunate to have with us the conservation photographers responsible for those great photographs. Rob Badger and Nita Winter will take us on a journey with them in their 27 years photographing California or photographing wildflowers in California and the West. And we'll discuss climate change, uh, which threatens this part of our natural history. They, I have to be honest with you, their bios are huge. So we're gonna we're gonna do a condensed version of it. Uh, and I thank them for allowing that to happen. Internationally acclaimed conservation, conservation photographers, Rob Badger and Nita Winter have been life partners and creative collaborators for more than three decades. Their work has been featured in Time, Mother Jones, the Sierra Magazines, the New York Times, Washington Post, San Francisco Chronicle, and the Los Angeles Times. And congratulating them, they are recent recipients of the Sierra Club's 2020 Ansel Adams Award for Conservation Photography. Please use the chat window at the bottom of the screen for any questions that you have. Feel free to send in your questions at any time during this presentation, and we'll address them at the end. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome in both Rob and Nita. Morning, guys. Good morning. Good, good morning, Dan. Thank you for that uh, short bio. That's enough. <laughs> no. So we we really appreciate the introduction, and we're grateful for everyone who showed up in the middle of a beautiful Bay Area day after all this all this rain. People are probably tempted to spend a lot of time outside. So thank you for for being here. Uh, as Dan said, we're going to take you on our 27 year journey uh, photographing wildflowers throughout the state. I wanna emphasize that almost all of it, almost all of it was done on our public lands, whether it's national public lands like parks or even little regional parks. We wanted people to know what was on the land that has been protected. And so we're going to introduce you to how we work and our 12 time award winning coffee table book, which was a result of this work and it, its companion traveling exhibit that was at the museum. This was a very collaborative project. We couldn't have done it on our own. And we love working with other individuals and organizations. We co-published the book with a California native plant society. And without the local chapters and local chapter members, we wouldn't have been able to find all the flowers that we wanted to photograph and be there at the right time, because so often it's about timing. And we also wanted a diverse group of voices for the wildflowers. We'll talk about that a little later. For those of you who cannot stay for the full program, if you wanna learn more or see recordings, um, Wildflower Books, dot com is the wildflower is the website to go to and you can purchase books there but you can also get them at the museum this all started in 1992 i was at a, a photo lab in san francisco processing film i came across a friend of mine a nature photographer liz hymans and she said you know the antelope valley california poppy reserve in the western part of the Mojave Desert is having a really, really good year after six six bad years. She said, you know, you've been a nature photographer in California for years. I'm sure you've been to the poppy reserve to, to see the poppies. I said, no, you know, I said kind of sheepishly, no, I haven't. She said, really? Well, you really have to go down there. So a couple of days later, she and a friend of ours and I drove from San Francisco down to the poppy reserve, which is about a six hour drive. And we came across this amazing 
field of beautiful California poppies. And what made this such a very unusual year is usually uh, you'd see this landscape which is completely covered with poppies. But this year, what made it so much more colorful was the fact that there were these beautiful purple-tipped bird's eye gilias that you see here scattered throughout the flowers. So this carpet of flowers had uh, quite a different uh, look to it because it had so many different colors. So this this part of the of the Mojave, the western part is pretty windy. It was, it was too hard to photograph. So we came back a couple days later and got a few frames. It was still in the wind. I called Nita that evening and told her how just mesmerizing it was to stand in front of this uh, vast landscape and see these waves of wind moving over these different colored flowers. These, you know, just, it was just a really dynamic moving landscape. So um, I didn't want her to miss it. I drove back to San Francisco the next day, uh, picked her up and we uh, came back and photographed in, in all, in the reserve and and beyond on public land to see this amazing spectacle of nature's beauty in a super bloom. And Rob and I had both grown up in the Northeast and we had never experienced wildflowers like this. And so we were, once we experienced this, we were hooked and we knew we wanted to keep finding um, and experiencing the uh, West's public, uh, West wildflower blooms. And so we started photographing throughout the West as well as California. And at the time we met, which was 36 years ago, I was a people photographer. I did a lot of work, documentary photography and other work to celebrate diversity, create healthy communities. And Rob's work was um, mostly landscape based, nature based. And we met in a photo lab. I was waiting for my prints and this prince came along. And she always says this and it always makes me smile. And many years later, we decided that we were going to focus on wildflowers. So uh, one of the most frequent questions we get asked is oh, how far back do these images go? Uh, well, I met Nita in 1986, two years. 84. Pre oh, thank you. No, <laughs> 86. Uh, two years previously, I um, was looking for a landscape that had these beautiful California buckeye trees in it. I came across th this scene and there are these pretty purple flowers. That time I didn't know what they were. So I said, well, I, I might as well include the, the flowers in the composition. So this is the earliest uh, image in the book. It was done on film. I started uh, using digital photography in 2006. We'll talk about that later. So I had been doing a lot of landscape photography and uh, I wanted to do something more than just get my images into books or calendars or note cards. Uh, so I was uh, wondering what else could I do with my work that would ha have a positive impact. Nita suggested that I contact the Trust for Public Land in San Francisco, uh, a national land conservation organization. So I contacted them and I was fortunate to do over 30 pro uh, projects for them over the years. So this is an example of one of them. This was privately held ranch land in, this, in the Sierra foothills that was adjacent to Sequoia National Park. This, this had ecological and conservation value. So the Trust for Public Land was able to buy this land and hold it until uh, the uh, Park Service could uh, pay for the land and convey it into Sequoia National Park. I'd also been doing a lot of other environmental work. I did a project over the years of uh, documenting mining on public land, showing a lot of the devastation that was happening on our public lands with gold mining. Also did a lot of work on, on, on water issues and uh, logging issues. And it was becoming so depressing to go to these scenes. I'm, there were some places I'd go and I'd literally have tears in my eyes because I was so sensitive to all the, all the destruction that was going on. So I decided I was just gonna stick with uh, the, 
work that showed the beauty of what we have on our public lands and with the intent to preserve it. When I first came to California from the Northeast, I um, became a firefighter and I was the first woman stationed in Leggett in Northern Mendocino County. And I kept a small uh, Raleigh point and shoot on my belt. And I was coming up from the Eel River after laying a, a pump and, and hose line and came up and saw this scene. The, the um, smoke is so black because this was a pile of giant tires for land moving equipment that was burning and just timed it perfectly. And this was the first award I won, which was from Nikon's international competition. The image on the right is the work that I was doing. Um, I did a series on the children of the tenderloin. This was the first of, of uh, two uh, series that I did. And that launched my career photographing children and families. On the left is uh, from a powwow at San Francisco State. And I started doing the calendars for the Children's Defense Fund and collaborated with Taya Schrack, who was a great uh, hand colorist uh, who worked with me. On the right is a series that I started one of uh, a number of public art projects. These were seven foot banners that hung in the streets that celebrated the diversity of a community, whether it was age, ethnic, um, sexual preference, et cetera. And then I was having some health problems. So I started to back off and spend uh, more time with Rob out in the field photographing wildflowers. This is an area south of Lake Tahoe near Carson Pass. It's uh, a place where a few different bioregions converge. So uh, Nita and I decided that we'd backpack in instead of doing the usual day trips in and out to places where we were photographing. Backpacking in meant uh, we'd have more time to photograph more species. When you've got different bioregions that converge, there are a whole lot more flowers to find in a smaller area. So I was carrying 85 pounds of gear. It was about 25 pounds of camera gear and then lighting gear and then backpacking gear. And Nita was carrying 65 pounds. Uh, it allowed us to stay there, but it just, I'm there. <laughs> I'm never going to carry that much weight again. But and neither am I. I normally would carry more like 25 pounds. Um, and this was an interesting experience. We are uh, out after Labor Day. And because there had been so much snow that year, similar to what's going on this year, the flowers were actually three to four weeks late because they were waiting for the snow to melt back. And this was one of our early experiences with climate change and the, you know, going from drought to deluge. In order to be able to pay for the work that we were doing, we were fortunate to connect with architects and art consultants who started using our work in uh, medical facilities. In this case, this is the uh, Kaiser Redwood City Medical Center. We had 34 images built into the architecture. And these are lobby dividers that are eight feet tall by 20 feet wide. Whenever we could, we, uh, we wanted to get our, our native plants into uh, use for uh, art installations. So this is an example of a, a California poppy that I photographed using a technique that I developed called the contact series that allowed me to get the flower petals gently in touch with a filter over the lens. And we'll talk about that technique later when we take people behind the scenes and show how we get all the flowers that we photograph in the field using only natural light. And in California, we can photograph um, wildflowers 12 months of the year, but there aren't very many of them. So sometimes we'll go out and go to uh, uh, wildlife reserve preserves and, uh, and photograph the, the birds there. And then we've used these images, both as fine art sales, the individuals, as well as in the healthcare centers. One of the most frequent questions we get asked is, do you have a favorite wildflower bloom after photographing wildflowers for over 30 years? And yes, we certainly do. 
uh, in, 19, in 2003, above the town of Gorman, where Interstate 5 goes through from Los Angeles over uh, the Tehachapi's down into the valley, the, there was this amazing bloom of wildflowers. I'd been traveling up and down I-5 for since 1966, and I'd never seen a bloom like this. So uh, we learned about this online, Nita and I went down. We were photographing so many different types of flowers. This is a close-up of some of the different species that we saw. There are lupin, there are fiddle neck, there are, there are, there are poppies, but this color palette made amazing uh, comp compositions. From the bottom of the freeway to the top of the ridges was a thousand feet high, and this extended for a mile wide. So we were fortunate to get um, have public land on the west side of the freeway. The freeway goes between these two hills and be able to look back on what's now privately held land, but hopefully it's someday will be protected. What made this so interesting and also kind of difficult to photograph was the fact that we had arrived there at the end of a late spring storm. So as the storm was dissipating, there were these beautiful shafts of light moving across the landscape that created these really dynamic compositions. And one of the hardest things to do was to photo, was to choose what was the best image while this uh, whole while the scene was changing. So we were able able to get a lot of different floral compositions that were accentuated by the by the dark skies in the background. Our second favorite location was back in uh, 2017 was the Carrizo Plain Super Bloom. And one of the things which was really interesting as we came over the Tembler Mountains from the Bakersfield side was the difference here between south facing and north facing slopes. On the west side of the uh, plain is the Caliente Mountains. And the plains and the mountains run north and south. And we had been told that the desert candles were in bloom en masse up on the Caliente Mountains. And we had never photographed them before this trip. And here we came around the corner and here were tens of thousands of these beautiful desert candles. Now, one of the other favorite questions we get asked is, uh, do we have favorite wildflowers? Well, we have a few and this uh, desert candle is one of them. One of the, re uh, the, the reasons why it's one of our favorites is because it's a very unusual species that's a member of the mustard family. It has this long, hollow stem that uh, when there's light behind it just really, really glows. You have these intense magenta flower buds at the top as the, as the flowers open. You have these delicate white flowers and then these slender green leaves. So it's a very, very unusual flower. Uh, and it's one of our, our favorites. So for those of you who don't know where the Carrizo Plain is, it's, it's kind of halfway between San Luis Obispo and Bakersfield. So right now we're coming down the Caliente Mountains and looking across at the Tembler Mountains and Bakersfield is on the other side. And this is about 60 miles long. Um, and there were huge patches of yellows and purples. Um, it was quite an amazing sight. And this is a close up of what you might see down in the flat area. And this was taken with an iPhone 6. And we realized that we use 12 different cameras over the years, ranging from film cameras, such as the Hasselblad, to uh, different generations of um, digital cameras as they got better. Well, I mentioned earlier that we'd like to take people behind the scenes to show how we get the wildflowers uh, photographed out in the field. Every flower we photographed is, is photographed safe and sound within the ground. We don't remove the flowers and we do as much as we can to not disturb the environment uh, around them. The upper left-hand corner is an example of what we call bo botanical portraits. What we do is we isolate the flower with either white or 
black backgrounds and the intent is to show as much in focus as so we can show as as much detail as we can about about the blossom and the plant another way we photograph flowers is um we uh i wrap the flowers with either white or black fabric i I started doing this because after after a while doing just strictly absolute black or white backgrounds behind the flowers started to be just doing the same thing over and over. I wanted to do something different. So I came with this idea to use the fabric that we had behind them to um, complement the uh, the composition of the uh, of the flowers that we're photographing. And after experimenting, for those of you who want to try this, we found that chiffon worked the best, except if you have any breeze, it'll it'll blow it away and change your folds. The other way we I, I photograph flowers is uh, called uh, the contact series. I found that I could get the flower petals gently in touch with the filter over a wide angle lens that had an extension tube behind uh, between the lens and be and, and the camera. So the extension tube allows me to photograph very, very closely to the front of the lens. So because the lens and the camera were blocking the light that would normally fall on the flower and be reflected off it, the only source of light available was whatever light was reflecting off, to, uh, off of whatever was in the background. So you have the light coming from the background being transmitted through the, through the delicate flower petals. And it's a much more abstract way to photograph the flowers instead of the strict botanical type pho photographs I talked about earlier where everything is in focus. And I always have something, some areas of the scene in sharp focus to show s some of the realistic details of the, the flowers. And this allowed Rob to get off the tripod and be more, much more spontaneous. Oh, so people often ask, well, how long does it take to photograph a flower? You're setting up and putting backgrounds and things. Well, this, when we were doing film, it took quite a bit of time uh, this took the longest. This was a two and a half hour uh, photo session with this beautiful California desert lily. Nita had found the flower the previous evening as 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 it was getting dark. So we decided to come back early the next morning and get this beautiful lily. This the time we were photographing was an El Nino bloom. Uh, it was a high rainfall year in 2005. Normally, this desert lily is about a two to three foot tall plant with uh, blossoms alternating going up this tall stalk. This year, I mean, this particular plant was uh, putting all its energy into buds and blossoms. It had three stalks, and you can see all the buds that this plant was creating to create more seeds to add to the uh, seed bank in the soil. So after doing a bunch of Polaroids, uh, filling in light uh, reef with, with reflectors, uh, this was the image that we finally got. And on the left side, you see the pile of jackets and, and camera bags. Those were put there um, on purpose to block the light from hitting the sand and the leaves so that we ended up with this image. So that was using film. After converting to digital, we uh, were wondering, well, how much time does it take doing it this way? So after tracking uh, different portraits for quite a while, we figured out it takes about an average of an hour to do a flower. So uh, this is one way how we uh, set up flowers. And, and, and I just want to mention that we live five miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge. So Marin County is a great place for biodiversity and finding wildflowers. And I, the images are his, hers, and ours. Uh, most of them are collaborative. I was called Eagle Eyes as a kid, so I was great at finding flowers. And I was really fortunate to have 
Rob, who was not only willing to carry all that equipment, but be in really uncomfortable positions um, to get the, the images. And then we would discuss the Polaroids or what was in the back of the camera uh, once we went to digital and, and collaborate on the composition. So you don't have to have a lot of fancy equipment to get um, to do the work that we did. And uh, you just have to have a lot of patience and be willing to um, be rather uncomfortable at times. So as I said previously, we would put white or uh, or white and or backgrounds behind the flowers, photograph them and then go home, uh, download the images and see which uh, version that we liked. And as Rob mentioned, we don't wanna create any damage. So we often would photograph off the side of the road or on the edge of a trail. And if we couldn't get access without doing damage, we would bypass that particular flower and find another one. And also we don't always photograph from the front. Sometimes it's more interesting from the back. This uh, beautiful Franciscan paintbrush that's in Rodeo Valley in Golden Gate National Recreation Area was a wonderful uh, uh, specimen that I had been looking to photograph. After photographing the entire plant with the beautiful blossoms on top, I looked more closely at it with the macro lens and saw that just photographing the very, very tip of this uh, and abstracting the composition it gave me a feeling of almost flames, red flames coming out of the top of the plant. So we don't always photograph the entire blossom. Um, sometimes we're just looking for abstract compositions that still show details and the beauty of the flower. And often, um, this is uh, up on Mount Tamalpais, which is one of our uh, favorite eight places to go. Um, some of the flowers not only are beautiful, but also have this beautiful fragrance. So if you're ever around Western azaleas, um, stop and smell the flowers. Can you go back for a second? Sure. So if you look uh, kind of in the middle, you can see all the equipment that we're carrying to get all the all the all the floral portraits that we're doing. This is Nita's image of a beautiful Shasta iris that we found in Plumas National Forest. A lot of these images that you're seeing are, uh, are pages in the book. So we work with natural light as Rob mentioned and we use diffusion disks to soften the light that allows us to photograph throughout the day when the sun might be really harsh. And here's another example of photographing right by the side of the road. And we can decide where we wanna put the diffusion disc and how close, what angle. And in this case, we wanted it to be um, from behind so that it looked like the flower itself was glowing, but the front of it was gonna to be too dark. So we put a reflector underneath the camera to bounce light back into the plant itself. And you might be able to see on your screen that this was another one of the wrap series. And this was a heavier fabric we were using earlier on. I also wanna mention that we are currently working to raise funds to create an audio described version of our book for the visually impaired. Imagine that you can't see any of the flowers or you can't see them clearly that we've been showing you. So we are working to create an audio described version of the book. Um, not only are we gonna describe what it looks like, but what the experience was, the environment was, was how we photographed it and then use recordings by world renowned soundscape uh, record artist, um, Bernie Krause to give you, to give people a sense of what the environment is like. And you can go on our website and see listen to a uh, an eight minute sampler. This is another example of the rap series. This was done up on uh, Ring Mountain, uh, which is Marin County uh, open space land. And that's I, Mount Tamalpais in the background. And you can see Mount, you <laughs> can see Mount Tamalpais in the, in the background. Um, and this 
is our favorite place for wildflowers in Marin County. It's a uh, Ring Mountain uh, preserve, and it was preserved because not only all the flowers that are there, but this particular one called the Tiburon Mariposa Lily, which only grows on Ring Mountain and nowhere else in the world. We've hiked up to uh, 11,000 feet in the, in the Sierra and up to over 13,000 feet in the Colorado Rockies to get alpine, you know, to get true alpine species. This is an example of the beautiful pygmy daisy part of the rap series. And you could see in the previous image that it was just a really, really rocky background. So uh, it's one reason why we wrap the flowers to uh, eliminate anything that might be distracting. On the way back down, we found this beautiful alpine columbine, and perhaps you can see all the folds we've wrapped. I wrapped around this beautiful white columbine. Uh, one reason it takes over an hour to do a flower is we look at the flower. It's sometimes under direct sunlight, sometimes under diffuse sunlight. Uh, in the previous image. Uh, you Oops, could sorry. see that there are these beautiful specular highlights on the on the irises flower petals. So uh, I wanted to photograph it that way. Then we used a diffusion disc, and you get a very very much different feeling for the flower. So that's one reason that why it takes so long to do it because not only will we try different lighting conditions, but we'll also try different uh, angles of it. I'm photographing on the tripod. Nita's holding often a diffuser or something to block the, to, uh, block the wind. She has a different perspective. I'll show her what I've got and she'll say, why don't you try something this way? So as she mentioned, the photographs are his, hers, and ours. It's a very uh, collaborative team sweetie process. Another question we get asked is, well, how much Photoshop work do you do to get the images? Well, our intent is always to show people what it was we saw and what it was anyone else would see if uh, if they were there. So the image that the camera creates um, records the actual color of light falling on the scene. In this instance, the, the, almost the entire image was illuminated with, with uh, light from the blue sky because we were in almost complete shade. The only part of the scene that was in sunlight was right at the very, very top in the middle. You can see a little bit of the yellow. So the camera, as I said, records the, 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 the color and quality of light falling on the scene, which in this instance was blue. Well, our minds correct for, uh, for color cast. And so what our intent is to go into Photoshop and like I said earlier, create what it was we saw. The camera is the camera sensor is designed to record as much uh, of a contrast range as possible. So it creates a very low contrast image to include all the different subtle shades of light and, and dark. It also is designed to create to record as many different colors as possible on the scene. So it gives you a very low contrast image. So we have to go into Photoshop. We photograph in the raw, in the raw file format and we make all the adjustments we need to to uh, show people what it was we actually saw. And because we're doing flowers and people wanna know exactly what the colors were, everything has to be accurate. So in the previous image of the raw scene, you can see the flowers look a little blue, but when we corrected it, the white flowers are actually pure white. So, the, so that's a long explanation of what we do, but every I mean, a lot of people know, well, how much do you Photoshop your images? And then we uh, have to put backgrounds behind them and sometimes there are folds in them and there are uh, reflections or shadows. And so we go in and we clean up the background but we always do put a background behind them if they're if it's you see it with a white or black background sometimes it's really windy so we're also dealing with um blowing sand and in this case we had to uh put two pieces of fabric together 
and you can see where they're overlapping. Um, maybe not during the day, it might show up a little better at night and all the sand. So we take it into Photoshop, we clean it up, we bring up the saturation again and the uh, contrast to bring it back to what we, we remembered seeing. This is an example of a two page spread. So we're dealing with rain, we're dealing with wind, we're dealing with heat. Um, in this case, we were in Utah and go going from Capitol Reef National Park to Taos, New Mexico. And I saw these penstemons that I really wanted to photograph. And so we stopped and we had been dealing with no seams biting us at Capitol Reef. And we stopped at this place to photograph and within about three to five minutes, the noceums had found us again. And we're going, where are they coming from? They are nasty little biting bugs and they get into everything. They get into our ears, our noses. This is why I went back to the car to get clean underwear to put over our heads in order to keep them out. And, and I'm spending a lot of time on the ground in one position. So there's no way that I'm gonna avoid them. What just really, um, befuddled us was we would drive some place after we'd left a place where we were photographing, uh, pull off the side of the road, and in five minutes, the bugs showed up, and it was almost like they were following us, which they couldn't. So I did a little bit of research and found that uh, no, no seams feed on the nectar of the plants, but they need blood to reproduce. So um, I, I was just being stung over and over over the period of time. I, I counted at 200 different bites, but it's just, just something you need to do. I mean, fortunately, we don't we haven't experienced them in in California. So this is some of the stuff that we go through to get the images that take so much time to do. So we um, had been photographing throughout the West and we were asked to do an exhibit at the San Francisco Main Library's Jewett Gallery, um, but to focus on California. So we ended up with Beauty and the Beast, California Wildflowers and Climate Change. And it's a hundred images, it was a hundred images um, and showed some of the books that we used for identifying um, plants, we also um, had binoculars in here, the, something that's really good when you're looking for wildflowers. And we had found, uh, met somebody who was hiking with these wonderful knee pads up on Mount Rainier. And that they were like kneeling in stiff jello. So it was really um, important for us to get these knee pads, which were fortunately donated to us by Ergodyne. Uh, so that we could continue the work we were doing. Yeah, these knee pads allowed me to spend a lot more time in one position on the ground because there, you know, occasionally we'd be photographed plants that were just in, you know, completely r rocky areas. Um, one thing I wanted to mention was the original exhibit was over a hundred uh, images, and Amy Cohen uh, with Exhibit Envoy. Uh, wanted to travel the exhibit, but she said there were too many images. So we struggled to uh, cut it down to about 50. So that's what uh, your visitors may have seen. We also um, were fortunate to have the San Diego Natural History Museum create a custom large print version that they called California Blooming, Wildflowers and Climate Change in the Golden State. And that hung for a, over a year. And some of the images were 12 feet tall. And they and went- It's well, now down, so yeah, yeah. you can't and, see it there, but- And they went through some of the same COVID issues that, that you did too. Yeah, they had to delay it almost six months before it actually opened. So we have um, educational panels with the exhibit, but we wanted to go beyond that. So we decided to create a companion coffee table book and again, have diverse voices. We have 18 short stories by 16 different authors, people like Jose Gonzalez, who's the founder of Latino Outdoors, writes about his connection to nature. Um, and the ages range from uh, 22 to 82. 
The book is divided into three sections, the gift of beauty, the human connection, and ensuring the future. And a purpose of this exhibit and, and book is to inspire hope and action. And so ensuring the future includes different things you can do, including a list of 25 things you can do to make a difference. So the, Calif the Wildflowers and Climate Change uh, essay was written by Gordon Lepig, who's with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Ryan Burnett with Point Blue Conservation Science was studying um, the effects of climate change on the mountain meadows and how it affected the Rufus hummingbird in its epic migration from Mexico up to the Northwest and even to Alaska. And if it didn't have, if the timing wasn't correct, in other words, if the flowers are three to four weeks late, it doesn't have the fuel it needs to finish the migration. And he was finding that there definitely was a decrease in the number of hummingbirds making this migration. So Nita's talking about the timing of things and the timing of natural events is called phenology. And so it's, it's, it's really interesting to see, as Nita said, how uh, if the flowers bloom too late or bloom too early, how it affects so, so many other species. This image on the right, which, which is it, in the book, is the luckiest image that we've made over the years we've been photographing. I was photographing this very, very tall scarlet fritillary native lily in Oregon. And uh, because the uh, plant is so tall, it moves ver very easily in the slightest breeze. I had sat up there for a while waiting for the wind to stop. Uh, wind stopped briefly. I, my eye was on the viewfinder. My finger was on the rem remote release. I was wanting to get the image as this bird flew in. I got two frames and it was gone. Nita waited patiently for a while later, standing perfectly still, uh, tried to see if the bird would come back. It never did. So this was a really, really fortunate image. On the right-hand side is the raw file that we photographed. And then after we took it in, into Photoshop and did the raw file conversion, this was what we got. So we're encouraging people to plant native uh gardens and help the pollinators. We have a story on by Susan Twight on the five deserts in California. Robin Wall Kimmerer, you may know her work from braiding sweetgrass. She's a Native American botany professor and she wrote a wonderful story on the history of naming plants. Wendy Takuda is a, a retired local news anchor. She got involved in doing uh, restoration work after she retired and wrote this very funny story about Zen and the art of pulling broom. Amber Paris talking to children about climate change without scaring them. And Guinevere Arnold with the Theater Pain Foundation is in charge of their seed bank and she writes about that, which is very interesting. We also have a section in the book uh, devoted to uh, fire ecology of uh, what happens after fires go through a, an area. This is an image of a beautiful California fire poppy that we photographed in Cleveland National Forest in Southern California near Lake Elsinore. And if you ever hear the term fi fire followers, that's one of the types of plants that will show up after fires. This area had been com completely burned. This was public land, uh, Redbud uh, region in Lake County. And this is only six months after the fire. And this is what came back um, after a good rain it, or a good number of rains of that year. And wildflowers, can, can do very well after a fire because the overstory has been burned away. They are getting more sun. The ash works as a fertilizer. And for some of the flowers, um, 
the smoke actually triggers the seeds to, to sprout and bulbs in particular do very well. This area was completely burned. Uh, and then you could see what came next. This was a little bit farther down the road in the same area. So even in, in the same area, you, you, you can get great floral diversity after a flower, after a fire. And what's interesting too is you, you have all the thatch, all the old grasses burned away. So what comes back is really um, quite striking. You can this, see. Oops. Go ahead. Where do you want me to go? Um, uh, my turn. Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, you can see in the upper left. You can see in the upper left-hand corner that this area had been burned. This is of uh, what's the the Pepperwood Preserve, oh, right, which right. was east of. Santa Rosa, and this was the Tubbs fire that, that unfortunately killed a, a large number of people in the fire. Some individual flowers that we found. Nita found these two flowers next to each other. We didn't put them there that way. We liked the composition of the nice color contrast. We're gonna quickly take you through uh, some of our favorite areas, some of our favorite deserts. This is Death Valley. Um, one of the reasons we really like it is you get to see the geology in relation to the flowers and flowers coming out of what you would think is not um, fertile grounds. And if you look really closely, um, it's amazing what you can find. In this case, Rob found this broom rape growing right out of the rocks. Watching for insects associated with the plants, with the flowers. And in 1998, we went to our first 100 year bloom in Death Valley. And now they're called super blooms because of climate change, we're getting that, that swing of drought to deluge that you're getting uh, them so often that they're now called super blooms rather than 100 year blooms or 50 year blooms. This uh, was taken in the Southern end of Joshua Tree National Park. Joshua Tree National Park has two deserts. The upper uh, kind of Western part is the Mojave. The lower part is the Sonoran Desert. Uh, Joshua Tree, uh, it's just, you know, the geology is dominated by granite. So the granite uh, weathers into these really, really coarse soils. And what makes it so interesting is you see flowers growing out of what looks like just really fine gravel. In this, this particular year right here, uh, this was a typical example of a desert Canterbury bells in a desert wash. The, you can see how tall the flower is and the flowers were just scattered throughout the wash. Well, in 1998, again, those El Nino rains, we went to Joshua Tree and there was so much rain, it lasted so long that the, you know so many of these beautiful desert Canterbury bells were coming out of this coarse granitic soil. So it was a really beautiful abstract uh, image in this desert wash. And not only were there so many flowers, but because it lasted so long, the, the plants were much bigger than they normally would be. And we just love the diversity and the colors and the shapes and sizes. These are all images in the book. Uh, this is now, uh, Anza Borrego Desert State Park, uh, which uh, you may remember if we mentioned, we found that first desert lily that it took us so long to photograph. And we go to the southern end of the park because there are um, fewer people there, but still beautiful blooms. The two page spreads in the book. And we were there for 12 days and we had rain, some rain over nine days. So it all started again back in 1992 in the Antelope Valley, California Poppy Reserve. This was taken on digital, on a digital camera, maybe 10 or 12 years later. I didn't mean to, sorry. And then this was taken during that Gorman trip. So these are the same dark clouds. We went over to Antelope Valley. And as you notice, there aren't any uh, bird's eye gilia um, that year. So again, we wanna make a difference with this project. We wanna encourage people to vote, plant native gardens, 
join local chapters, et cetera. We have information in the book as well as on the website about this. We encourage people to become citizen scientists. You can do it in your backyard or where you go hiking with iNaturalist and Nature's Notebook. It helps scientists around the world. Uh, we're gonna show you more images in the book. Uh, this is one example of a species that we photographed out of state. Uh, we hadn't yet found this beautiful prickly poppy in California. We, uh, if we're photographing images out of state, um, we make sure that they live in the state if we're including them in the book. So this is one example of a beautiful uh, prickly poppy. We're also looking for in interesting natural rock backgrounds behind some of the flowers. This is a serpentine boulder we found in the Sierra foothills with this uh, ludex lily right in front of it. Another favorite place to go is Table Mountain. You may have heard of it near Chico. Um, apparently people are sort of abusing the space. So th I think you have to uh, get reservations now to go to Table Mountain. So here's a few examples of our two page spreads. This was photographed in Mount Rainier, the common harebell, and it does live in California. So if you're learn, uh, looking to find ways to identify plants, one of the options is plantid.net. It's especially good for beginners. Calflora is more advanced um, and also an excellent source. If you wanna do native plant gardening, uh, California Native Plant Society's Calscape is great. There's even a garden planner um, to help you decide what plants are best for your region and your topography. Wildflower reports, um, and you can get a lot of this information off our website. Is Theater Payne Foundation has a great wildflower hotline, um, as well as CNPS Facebook page and DesertUSA.com. So again, we just love the diversity in the shapes, sizes, and approach of plant, plants to attract their uh, pollinators as well as to um, uh, protect themselves. These are native orchids. These are all two-page spreads in the book. We also have a a map in the exhibit and also in the book about the 14 ecological regions of California. The book has a glossary. There are 18 different uh, short stories that may contain words or terms that not everyone is familiar with. We, so we included that. The book also has two indices, a plant name index. So if you're saying, well, where is the, where is this, flower on what page, and it also has an index that is a location index. So if you want to find images that are in Death Valley, you can find that. So we have two versions of the book available. Um, at the museum is the regular edition book, and we also have online the deluxe limited edition book that comes in a clamshell box as well as a uh, special cover and tip in, signed tip in page. If you get access to the regular edition book, we encourage you to uh, peel back the paper dust jacket to find this really wonderful uh, cover below it. And we want to thank people for joining us on this afternoon. And um, we look forward to doing questions. Also just wanna mention that, again, we're trying to do the accessibility project for the visually impaired and those without access to nature. And we are a sponsored project of marinlink.org so we can take that tax deductible donations. So you can learn more about all of this at wildflowerbooks.com. And we like to end with a quote by David Brower. 
truth and beauty can still win battles. We need more art, more passion, and more wit in defense of the earth. So thank you for hanging in there with us. We're at 52 minutes, and I think we snuck in under our deadline. You did indeed. And thank you for that. Um, oh, you're welcome. We, you guys have, you were talking about one of my favorite images from the book, which is the oh, Rufus Hummingbird good. image. I think that was, I thought that was fabulous. Um, so we now you know the story about, behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry for interrupting you. No, we were, we were chatting before um, the program started that one of the advantages that you have, or at least that I have, is that you get to spend a lot of time with when you're hanging a show, you get to spend to spend a lot of time with the show. Uh, and so um, the images were terrific uh, from from the show in the book. And um, as Rob and Nita mentioned, the book's available through their website in a couple of different versions. The museum uh, here uh, at San Ramon Valley also has copies of this version of the book. Um, you mentioned to me that you were from the East Coast originally, and so am I. Ah. And so one of my favorite flowers in this in California happens to be the state flower, the California poppy. Uh, I grow them at home. And I understand there's a story of how that came into be that it almost wasn't the California state flower. Would you like to to read that Rob? Sure well we'll read you some of the research that we dug up uh, so it's a state it's called state flowerhood on December 12th 1890 the California State Floral Society voted uh, this is before the California Native Plant Society voted to select a, a state flower the three nominees were Eschlosia californica which is the uh, California poppy Romea culturae, called the giant poppy at the time, but now referred to as the Medalahia poppy, and a, and, a, and a species of Calcordus. Cal, Calcordus genus has a lot of beautiful different flowers that includes the Mariposa lily. So the California poppy won by a landslide. Only three votes were cast for, for Calcordus and none for Romania writes Professor Emeritus of Biological Sciences at Cal Poly Pomoda, Curtis Clark. If the vote had gone differently those many years ago, it wouldn't be illegal to pick California poppies and, ins and instead of learning about them in elementary schools, children in California would have learned about an entirely different flower. There are 41 different native poppies in California, a few of which you have seen during this talk. You want to read the rest? No, that's about Antelope Valley. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that I thought was interesting about the book in particular was the diversity of the essays. And you, you've touched on a lot of them. How were those selected? And um, how did you reach out to the people that were, because you've got such a wide range of uh, authors. Uh, how did you work that out? Well, one of the things we didn't mention is it took us three years to put the book together. And one of the reasons was pulling together all these essays. So initially we created a glossary of an index of what we wanted in the book. Excuse me, not a glossary, but an index. What, what areas did we want essays to cover? And then we had to go find the people, the right people to write them. And uh, we actually worked with over 22 authors. Yeah and finally narrowed it down to 16. Um, and we ended up with 18 different stories. Yeah. For, for years, I had been looking at beautiful nature coffee table books and some of them that, you know, were focused on one, one particular topic and had a lot of text. And I mean, I'm a photographer. I, I, I would look at the images and kind of skim through the text, but after a while, just there was too much text. So I wanted to have as many different essays that address the different topics. Like, um, you know, we emphasize in our talk that we do everything uh, almost, almost exclusively on public land. So we wanted a, an essay on the value of, 
of of public land there was the the whole thing about well there's flowers and there's seeds so we found Guinevere Arnold who wrote a really wonderful article I mean a really wonderful short story on seed banking the intent was to have just just a few pages so people would see a section of flowers look at the stories the intent was to get people through the whole part of the book to not only see the beauty but learn as much as they could um we want to do it in a first first person storytelling yeah and we like, wanted right and 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 we wanted to promote volunteering so we had wendy takuda's essay so there are there are just so many different uh layers of what flowers mean to all of us and so uh, that's that's why we added all those short stories. I was the first and second editor for all the stories because I wanted to make sure there wasn't going to be a lot of overlap between the uh, amongst the different authors' stories. So that took a bunch of time, and that's why it took us three years to get the books out. But we tell people we believe that the short stories are just as important as the flowers there because I mean there's only so much you can do obviously with a with a picture and we wanted to show people what all the layers were that were behind what our mission is to help preserve public land uh, help pres you know prevent species extinction and hope to um, minimize the effect of climate change so so that's a long-winded answer to your question <laughs> yeah it's okay because I think that was one of the things that I really enjoyed about the book were, were the short stories coming from so many different authors, from so many different positions. Um, speaking of, of projects, you had talked about an audio described version of the book. Are there any other projects out there that you're working on or want to work? Well, I, I'm also wanting to do some children's books related to wildflowers and uh, um, have put some concepts together, but um, they're still in the works, so nothing immediate, but that's something that, that we've gotten a really great response to as well and and look forward to doing. We're still photographing. Okay. Speaking of that, I mean, you've been at it now for a number of years. Is there anything, is there a flower that you haven't photographed yet that you want to? Oh, yeah. There's this wonderful book called Calicordist. I should have brought it in. And it's these what amazing lilies that take these fantastic shapes. They have hairs in the center. Well, the Tiburon mariposa yeah. lily yeah. is an example of it. Yeah. But that one was just brown. They come in yellows and pinks yeah. and reds. And so there's a there are there's these beautiful, there's one species called Calicorda venestus. And you look at the pages in this book, and this one species exhibits so many different types of flower, different colors, you know, so different that's variations. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So many different variations. So that's one species I would really, really love to get. They bloom later in in like late, late spring. So um we have a we have a few calicorda species, but I mean. But this one, Venestus, is something that's just really fascinating because of all the variations. Okay. So I think, guys, our, our time is is up. I've really enjoyed the heck out of this, and I hope I hope that uh, um, you've enjoyed being our presenters today and, and our audience has enjoyed this. Um, again, back to the book. There are so many great resources available at the back end of the book or to go on Rob and Nita's website. Um, if you wanna get out there now that the rain stopped for who knows how long, but if you wanna get out there, um, there's a lot of resources in the book and on Rob and Nita's website that you can take advantage of. Um, and, and can I just ans answer this one question about uh, assuming that this will be a good wildflower year. Yeah. Uh, our, we know that Anzabrego actually started blooming early because they had really early rains. So part of it is a matter of uh, when the rains start, how long they continue. You don't want too much rain. You don't want too little rain. You don't want it to get too hot at the end because then the buds could just um, dry up. But I would assume that there are gonna be um, in certain areas, some really good 
wildflowers? What we do is we we check the website desertusa.com, uh, which we which we mentioned earlier. And uh, starting in uh, the beginning of the year when things start blooming, people uh, re you know report to that website what's going on. So you can see what's going on at Joshua Tree, Death Valley, Anza Borrego, and a lot of different places. There's this little you know one to ten graph that shows what it's like. So we watch it starting you know late January, early February. It's a really really good website. Uh, for desert super blooms. And I just yeah. added it to the chat as well as uh, um, there's also winterbadger.com if you want to see some of our other work, environmental work, people work, et cetera. That's our general uh, photography website. Okay, some good resources. Um, hopefully some good weather to get out there and, and look and take photographs. I'm glad you gave me permission to use my iPhone. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Because I was looking at your equipment going, I don't think I can ever do yeah, that. No. I mean, now I, I think some of the most recent iPhones let you do even macro work. But, you know, for for us is what do you do with the background behind it? You know, uh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the challenge. You know? <laughs> OK, well, thank guys, you, thank Sam. you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Nita. Oh, you're and welcome. Thanks. This was fun. Oh, I'm glad you had fun. I did too. Oh, good. Uh, and thank everybody for viewing this morning. If you missed any of our earlier programs, you can find them by visiting museum's website at museumsrv.org. Uh, today's program will appear early next week. So join us uh, in a month, next uh, month, February, Thursday, February 16th at 1130. We've taken you to Dublin, we've taken you to Alamo, we've taken you to San Ramon, and now we are headed out to East Contra Costa County. Local historian, college professor, and longtime East County resident, Carol Jensen, will discuss early Native American residents, settlers, landmarks, and historical events that have shaped the East County. She'll also talk about the growth of that region in the 20th century. If you like these programs and want them to continue, we ask that you make a donation by going to the museum's homepage, by muse uh, museumsrv.org, and clicking on the Donate Now button. We are also in need of volunteers, as is everybody, I think. If you can give us some time, please contact the museum. Hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. I know I did. Uh, stay safe, and thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.